Hey, Dave. Hey, chat. How are you? I'm doing okay. Oh, hang on. Uh, we are missing something. All right. Now this is a fireside chat. <laughs> I like it. Hey, everybody. I am Chet Haas from the Android Developer Relations team. And today I'm talking with Dave Burke, Vice President of Android Engineering. And we're going to have a conversation about a few things. So first of all, maybe a little context for this year. The last year, life has been What's the word? Interesting. So we've all been work from home full time since last March. How have you adjusted to this new reality? Or maybe I should ask, have you picked up any new or interesting hobbies to help energize you for the work and the life that we have now? Oh, really interesting question. I, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer at heart, so I'm always tinkering. And I think one of the nice things about working from home is it makes it easier to tinker because you got all your stuff around you and your kids are around and they, you can do projects with them. Um, you know, when the pandemic hit, everybody was arranging their, you know, their backdrop with the plant and the books, uh, and, and most importantly, your musical instruments. Um, I decided that the most important thing for me was that it was a vanity oscilloscope. So actually I have one right behind me here. And, uh, and then of course the question is like, what should the oscilloscope do? So I created this project, um, using an Arduino to generate X, Y signals to draw an analog clock. And it's kind of a fun project because it's like, you're basically drawing a clock without lifting the pen using like really high school trigonometry. Uh, so it's been fun to build that. And then, um, I've been starting to do some projects with my kids. So, uh, I'm building a, a little, uh, electric powered wooden boat with my daughter, which is kind of my six year old daughter. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then with my son, um, this one's a little stranger. Uh, he had a stem cell transplant when he was younger. And so what that means is he's a, a DNA chimera. So he has one DNA for his original body, if you like, and another DNA for the white blood cells. And so my son and I decided it'd be really cool to try to reverse engineer his donor. Um, and so we're procuring this low cost, uh, long read DNA sequencer, and then we're gonna try to sequence his DNA. And there's some really cool open source bioinformatic tools. And so we're gonna do some analysis. So yeah, I don't know, this, this shelter in place has definitely driven some rather strange uh, uh, projects, but it's kind of fun. And I don't think I would probably have done that, do, 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 have time for this if I was working in our regular office. So that's one of the nice silver linings. So let's see if I got this right. You took a break from software engineering to do hardware and uh, bioengineering? <laughs> I, I just like to tinker. It's fun. Yeah, I, it's yeah. You know, actually, I, I mean, I always feel like the the mix of hardware and software and and other fields like medicine is interesting. It's always the, that multidisciplinary, the things at the intersection where where I think there's untapped innovation, and so I guess I gravitate towards that when I'm tinkering with things as well. Yep. Also, that reality of engineers, engineer. It's it's what we do. Yeah. Anyway, it's what we do. Uh, let's move on. So today we're here for the Jetpack Compose beta show. So it's probably a good time to ask, what are your hopes for this new API? Or maybe I should ask, why is Android releasing a new UI toolkit? Yes, great question. Um, so, I mean, I if I think back a couple of years ago, I remember chatting with the team and I, I, uh, I, I was sort of challenging them, challenging them because our existing UI toolkit at that point was, you know, pushing on ten years old, um, and it served us well. But it's it's really been something where we've been uh, iterating over time and sort of retrofitting. And so, you know, when it started out, it didn't have hardware acceleration, um, and so we added GL acceleration later. Uh, we added things, and you know this because you wrote it, uh, the animation framework that we added on top. And so we've been sort of adding things along. Um, but in the meantime, you know, toolkits have been evolving and. You know, the challenge I gave to the team was like, hey, if we're starting again, what kind of toolkit would we build? Um, and this is sort of where Jetpack Compose came out of. And, and if you look at the toolkit, it's it's um, it's got a couple of attributes that I think are really important. It's first of all, um, it's it's declarative. Uh, it's all in line and compact. There's not like a separate XML file. It's re it's got a reactive uh, element to it, and then it's based on Kotlin Id idiom. So it's very modern and, and concise in how you use it. Um, and and I'm really happy actually with where it's ended up. Like if you see. Um, some code with Compose, it's very readable. Like even if you don't know Jetpack Compose, you're like, hey, I know, I think I know what this is doing. Um, and I think, you know, when you build toolkits, it's really important. I mean, A, they have to be 
powerful. They got to be able to get the job done, right? Um, but they also need to be um, intuitive and they need to be uh, enjoyable to use. Um, and I think that's something I sometimes overlooked. And I, I think with Compose, we I think we've got the formula right. And I think the you know we'll, you know time will tell. But I think you know the initial feedback that we're hearing from our developer community and and the, actually if you just go on something like Twitter and search and actually look you know for commentary on what people are thinking. I think the the feedback's been really positive. So I'm, I'm excited. I think Jetpack Compose you know sets us up for the next ten years. Um, and more than that, I think it's it's a flexible toolkit. And so it's not just for phones, but I think it's going to be for lots of form factors like watches, wearables, TV, auto, uh, tablets, laptops. Um, and so I think it's going to serve us well. Should be interesting. And yes, I agree. Engineers should be given tools that they uh, enjoy using. So let's see how this goes. Uh, so many of the changes in recent platform releases have focused on user privacy from location sharing to running apps and services in the background to uh, sharing access to the camera and the microphone and many other changes. So. The question is, why are we doing this now and where is this all heading? Yeah, I mean, I think that with security and privacy, I think the thing to realize is these are multi-year investments that we've been making. So we're constantly improving both. Um, and, the, and the two in some ways go together. Um, you know, if you look at security as an example, uh, you know, when Android 1.0 launched, the security model was based and is still based on the Unix process model. So that gives us the isolation. Um, but then over time, we improved that. We added SE Linux. So we can actually lock down processes and, and control what kind of user capa what capa OS capabilities they have. We've added um, file-based encryption. We've added verified boot. We've added ASLR. You know, just year on year, we've been constantly improving it. Um, and it's the same thing with privacy. So, uh, you know, a, a big milestone for us was Marshmallow when we uh, changed our permission system to be runtime based. Uh, but each year we've been adding new features. Um, Android 10 was a pretty interesting milestone. We had, I think it was 50 changes and features all related to privacy just in that one release. Um, Android 11 last year, we added more capabilities. Uh, one thing that was pretty interesting from last year is permission auto reset. So if you have an application that you somehow decided not to use anymore, eventually over time, I think it's you know order six weeks, we'll actually reset the permissions back uh, to sort of the null state as though you'd never used the app. Um, and so, we, you know, it's kind of a novel way of, of approaching privacy. And so, I mean, my ultimate goal is, is that Android is the most secure and privacy forward operating system. And that might seem ambitious, but we're actually seeing results. So, so if you look at the hacker community, um, uh, and you look at the bug bounties for a full chain exploit, uh, the, it's about it's worth about two million dollars on Android because it's so hard to do, um, and part of that is is all the work we've done on security for sure, but it's also the open source nature of the project. Um, uh, but it's really playing out. It's it's the hardest OS to hack in some ways, uh, or but you know by by that measure. And I think we wanted to get the same approach on privacy um, and have that same recognition. And so year on year, you'll just see us continually improving uh, privacy and security. All right. Uh, so I know that one of the larger areas that you've been concerned about in recent releases has been release adoption for this really large ecosystem that we have with Android. So this resulted in projects like Treble as well as the more recent mainline. So I wanted to ask what's going on with those projects? How are they doing and where are they headed in the future? Yeah, I think this is you know one of the unique things about Android is it's open source and it, and we it's a it's an enormous ecosystem and um, you know, updatability is something that we, you're right, we put a lot of effort in. This is, a, you know, it's another multi-year effort for us. Um, and we're seeing progress. We're seeing progress in dessert adoption. So how quick it takes for a new Android release to get adopted is now faster than ever. Uh, and it's been, that's been improving year on year. And that is thanks to the investments we've been making in travel and how we've been working with the Silicon ecosystem. Um, the security patch rate has also dramatically improved. So these are like the smaller monthly or, or quarterly releases that uh, patch your device for security exploits. And, and so that the take rates in those have got way a lot better. And again, it's because of the tooling. Um, and then we do ha we have these ambitious projects like Mainline that you mentioned, and uh, you know th the idea here is that modules in the operating system can be common across devices and then updatable on the devices. And uh, you know, one particular module we're working on right now, which is pretty exciting, is is the art runtime. And so making the art runtime 
module updatable in, on, on the device. Um, and we're also working on something we call generic kernel. And so here we're trying to have one common uh, Linux kernel um, uh, across all devices. Now, you know, obviously devices are wide and varied, and that's awesome. Um, they so de devices will have different device drivers uh, provided by the manufacturer, but the core kernel can can be common. And and if you have that, it means that devices can track upstream, so to the latest uh, the LTS, the latest long term stable version of the kernel um, and get all of the, the features and performance enhancements and crucially all the security updates. Because it turns out 40% uh, of the CVE, so it's 40% of the security exploits that you see on mobile devices actually are originate in the kernel. And so if you have that common kernel that's up to date, you actually can dramatically improve security. Um, but you know, ultimately, and, and by the way, if you think about having a generic kernel and then having mainline, if you could potentially have an updatable kernel and an updatable art runtime, the two really sort of go together. The, the, the interface is the syscall or the interface through libc or bionic in our case. Um, but really the goal is, can we get the, in some ways, boring parts of the operating system like kernels and runtimes? I say boring because to a user, I mean, from an engineer, they're fascinating, but can we get those boring parts to be common? Um, because by doing so, we improve compatibility we improve security, but we still leave lots of room and flexibility for device makers to differentiate and innovate uh, because that's what Android's really about. Um, so that's sort of where we're going and how we look at it. Uh, lots of work, and it's and, and again, a multi-year thing is a super complicated area. All right, so that's sort of present and looking forward to the future. Now let's rewind and talk about history a little bit. So you joined Google way, way back in 2007, and then a couple of years later, you joined the Android team. Smartphones, in the meantime, have come a long way since then. So what excites you about mobile computing these days? Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, honestly, it's been such an awesome ride to get you sort of on the ground floor in 2007 and, and, and sort of see and be a part of the innovation. You know, I, I, the, the thing that gets me excited is when we blow people's minds about what a phone or a smartphone can do. Or, or And, and um, I remember early on, I think it was 2000 and late 2007 or 2008, being on a bus. Uh, we were in Switzerland, I think it was. And and I showed someone um, uh, Google Maps. I think it was a feature phone and, and it had the blue dot and the blue dot was moving. And this phone did not have GPS. So this was based on our cell ID location system, a very early version of it. And the person's mind was blown. They were like, what? This is crazy. This is, and I'm like, yeah, isn't it amazing with no GPS? Like, and, and, you know, and I think if I look through the years, it's been, you know, innovations all along the way like that, you know, speech recognition on phones and voice search and where people, you know, it just, it really, bl you know, blows your mind. And, and, you know, I still think there's a ton of innovation still happening. And, um, and, you know, a good example, like, you know, just last, I think it was last September, last year, we built a new earthquake alerting and detecting system for Android. And what's really fascinating here is that we're really harnessing the fleet of Android devices uh, to build the world's largest seismometer network. Um, and so at any given time, because of the scale, there's going to be a, enough devices just sitting on a table stationary. Maybe they're being charged. Maybe they're just they've been stationary for the last ten minutes, and they all have accelerometers, very low, which are very low power. Um, and so you can detect seismic action uh, from these devices and aggregate them anonymously, um, and uh, and it's very effective. And so I I, I tweeted out a video uh, of of there was a quake in L.A. There were no injuries, thankfully. I think around September, um, and the 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 animation shows what the phones in the area saw. And so you can see the phones light up as they start seeing um, correlated vibrations effectively. And then you can see that what we call in, in, uh, in, in for quite the P wave and the S waves. The P wave is the primary wave. It's the first wave that comes out that ripples through the surface. And then the secondary wave comes a little bit later. And the secondary wave is the transverse wave. So that's the vertical shaking, and that's the one that causes the damage. Um, but the cool thing is we can get ahead of that because we can send a signal instantaneously. It's electromagnetic, uh, and we can get ahead and warn people up to forty seconds in advance that hey, there's an earth, there's a shake about to come. Get off the ladder, take some cover. Um, but anyway, I tweeted this thing, and it was quite amazing because one or two geologists saw it, and it it kind of blew their mind because they were like, "Wait, you can use your phones to do this thing, and at this scale?" And then, of course, those geologists retweeted it, and their other geologist friends were like, "Oh my god, this is cool!" And and so it was just very exciting for me to see geologists 
mind's getting blown about what's possible. And um, uh, it, it's, it's funny now, though, because I have like 100 geologists following me or hundreds, and they're going to be bitterly disappointed because I know nothing about geology. But, but, but you know, that's aside, it's cool. And, and, and I think there's lots of other examples, even just last year, of, uh, of this concept of showing um, surprising and amazing things technology can do. We, we've done a project uh, actually with Apple on the COVID-19 exposure tracking system. Um, Sorry, tracking is the wrong word. It's, it's actually designed to be super privacy forward. It does, it, it's a notification service. Um, and, uh, and, and the way it works is it uses Bluetooth low energy between phones and it will alert you if you've been in proximity with somebody who tested positive for COVID-19. So you know to quarantine. Um, and there were some results just out of the UK at Oxford this week that showed that the system in the UK that's ba- that was built on this uh, in the first three months averted 600,000 cases of COVID and saved on order like 8,000 people's lives. And so again, this is something with smartphones that you probably, we like, we would probably not have thought was obvious a couple of years ago, but like is now possible. And um, so anyway, I could keep going on. There's, there's so many cases. So I think, you know, it, it's sometimes a little hard when you're in the middle of sort of a technology revolution to situate yourself. Like, are we at the beginning or the middle or the end of a cycle? My view is there's still a lot more innovation to come and, and it's an exciting space to be working in. Yeah, it is pretty interesting when you marry the capabilities of these computers in our pockets with the scale that we have uh, in these smartphone ecosystems, as well as the inherent mobile part of that technology and the things that you can do that we are already doing. But as you're pointing out, like, you know, every month and year, we're coming out with even more things that maybe we didn't even imagine before. Exactly. So. exactly. And actually, that, that's the key word scale, like the, some of these use cases that are now possible is are because of the scale, like exposure notifications, like earthquake yep. detection. You you have to have that scale to be able to do it. And so, and there's a good a good thought exercise. Like, what else is possible given this technology and at scale? Um, and I think there's a lot more things possible. Yep, I hope so. Uh, so that was about sort of phones specifically, but clearly Android, uh, the OS has gone way beyond capabilities of just phones. And there's all these other device form factors that we're working with. Uh, so can you tell us a bit about what some of those form factors are and uh, where that side of Android is going? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm super bullish on foldable and rollable displays. And and you kind of know this. Anytime I talk about it internally, I'm very excited. And I think the team like just eye rolls. There's day going on about these things again. Um, but the, the the reason I'm so excited is I think it kind of creates a new category of device. I, you know, I was at a I was giving a talk, I think it was 18 months ago or thereabouts, and uh, it, it was internal. And, and, and I was like, hey, hands up, how many people have tablets? And of course, it's a techie audience. So everybody in the room put their hand up and they had a tablet. And I said, okay, cool. Hands up how many people have their tablet with them right now? Nobody put their hands up. And so if you think about a really nice foldable phone, um, you know, I think the first principle is you want the phone when it's folded to be a great phone. Um, so you don't have to open it up. Um, and so you're using it happily as a normal phone. It's great. And then you happen to sit down and you want to, you know, get immersed in content or you want to do some more productivity tasks. You open it up and now it's effectively a tablet. Um, and so I think it's just a really um, uh, compelling proposition. Um, and I think, you know, we're sort of at the second generation of foldable devices today, like the, the you know, the Samsung Fold 2 or um, the the Microsoft Duo, for uh, as an example. You know, this year we'll see third generations. Uh, you know, I'm aware of like some of the fourth generations that are in the works. Um, and so I just think it's just really exciting to see where it's going. And then, and then the rollable displays are also fascinating. Uh, some people might've seen uh, the LG rollable, uh, demo that you can Google around and find it. Um, but this idea that you, you know, you have a device and it just magically expands, you know, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, so I think, you know, then the role for Android and all of this is, is, is to, how do we take advantage of these dynamic changing screens? Like how do you have continuity? So you have an app when the phone is folded and then you open the the phone up and the app continues, but expands and gets better. Um, you know, what, what can we do in the operating system? And then crucially for developers, how do we ensure that we make it easy for developers to build great large screen applications? And so when I think of large screen, I'm thinking of these foldables. I'm also thinking of tablets. I'm also thinking of Chrome OS. 
Um, and, and I'm thinking about like, what are the tools that we can provide developers to make it easy? Um, Jetpack Compose, by the way, is one great example of that. You know, it's, it's a modern toolkit. It, it, it assumes, you know, different screen sizes and dynamic screen sizes uh, from the get-go. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's super important. And then, you know, I mentioned tablets. I think uh, if you actually look at the tablet adoption numbers, they're, they're, they're significantly up, unsurprisingly, in the last year. You know, I think COVID has driven, uh, uh, you know, regular people to use technology more. And, you know, tablets are actually a great video conferencing device, among other things. Um, and so roughly the industry has seen a 30% year-on-year growth in tablets. Um, and so, you know, we want to create more tools to help these large screens, not just for the foldables, as I said, but also for tablets. And, and so that's something you'll see us invest more in this year. Yeah, the, it's an interesting point about Compose because it has the advantage of coming along after the ecosystem has grown and all these capabilities exist, as opposed to the original platform, like the focus was phones. Maybe there were other things in the future, but getting the phone out there right. was really the main thing everybody yeah. was aiming at. And, and, I, and I don't. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I don't think any of us were thinking about rollable displays or foldable right. displays back then, right? It's like that, like that physics, that's all possible. Like, so, uh, I mean, we barely were thinking about touchscreens. So, yeah, there yeah. Were, it's, it's, quite amazing to see the progress. Pretty sure people were thinking 1.0. Can we reach 1.0 with yeah. a phone? That would be nice to have. That would be nice. Um, I remember those days. That's exactly what we were thinking. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the the um, the focus for today's event, obviously, is uh, Jetpack Compose. But recently, we released dev Developer Preview 1 for Android 12. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite feature or an area in the release uh, that we're working on, or at least one that you can actually talk about at this point in the release cycle? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think, you know, look, the first thing to, to point out is, is our, our, our first developer preview is always deliberately understated. Uh, it's really about sort of getting the, the machine greased up again and going and the API levels established and, and, and you know, whatnot, um, and sort of bootstrapping our developers early. Um, and we actually, have, we, you know, we have seven releases, uh, updates to that program planned. Um, and things don't really get interesting till the beta one. Uh, and so typically we, you know, we're, we're still working on features that are flagged off and then we'll turn them on in beta one. That's when it, when it gets exciting. So I can't talk too much about it. What I can say is we have a big year planned. There's a lot of cool stuff. I'm very excited about what we're building. Um, uh, I mean, even, I mean, look, even in the first developer preview, there's still some pretty fundamental, uh, things in there. You know, we've just added the, a new ability to do automatic media trans, um, transcoding. Um, and this has been a challenge for us because, you know, if you if you introduce a, a dramatically new codec, like let's say HEVC, which is a pretty well now established video codec, and your camera supports it and you record it, and then you go share that file with an app that doesn't support it, uh oh, you're broken. What do you do? And so we've added in a framework capability to dynamically translate. Uh, so the app, so apps that aren't ready will still work. And and that probably seems simple, but that was pretty complicated. It's taken us about um, you know 18 months, 24 months to get that right. <clears throat> so that's in the new release. Uh, there's lots of other fundamental things like much richer, you know, uh, copy paste clipboard, uh, fundamental things in the release. But, but the key point is the most exciting stuff yet to come. And unfortunately I can't talk about it just yet. Stay tuned. Nice teaser. Uh, yeah. all right. So final topic, um, as difficult and bizarre as the last year has been, it's also been really fascinating to see how uh, a people were able to completely shift to this different way of working. And a lot of that was due to um, the existence of all the online technologies that we have so that we could actually shift to working from home and still be able to hopefully do the things that we need to do. Um, so I'm curious uh, where you see Android or maybe mobile computing going in general. Like we've enabled so much already. Where else do we go from here? I mean, it's been, it's been fascinating to watch the last year um, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the computing aspect of it. Um, lots of other parts of the last year I could be happy to forget. Um, but, um, you know, I think, you know, I think about my kids and, and bringing them to medical appointments and just looking at how the medical industry has evolved. Like it feels like at least five years of advancement, maybe pushing on 10 for some institutions has happened in one year. Uh, you know, everybody is pretty much set up now for telemedicine. It's a default. And um, I think, you know, when the pandemic passes and it will pass, um, you know, folks will go back and actually there'll be less driving to do to bring your kids to these appointments because you can just zoom from home. It's going to be way more convenient and they're set up. And so um, I think that's one big, big noticeable change. And, and you know, we, we talked earlier about how tablets have increased 30 percent year on year. It's unsurprising because 
because people are now using them more and more for for remote communications. Um, you know, I think the other thing that's uh, that that I think is interesting is um, you know IoT is is uh, you know this Internet of Things is a, is a overused and probably slightly out of fashion phrase right now, but the whole concept of using your phone to control your physical world it's one of those things where you know it was it's sort of overestimated in the short term, but also underestimated in the long term. You know, I, you know, I think in five to 10 years, we'll look back and everything around you will be controlled by your phone. Will the phones will be optimized. So they work really well. And you can see, we, we added some device controls in Android 11. We're going to keep improving that. Um, but it's just going to become the norm. Your phone is going to be critical to control everything around you. And it's just, it's, it's kind of one of those things where it's just, it's, it's creeping up and, and, and it's in a good way and it's getting better and better and better. And, and you won't know how you lived without it in, in a couple of years. And it's going to be everything from door locks to cars to, you know, to, um, uh, what we have today in terms of like AC and cameras and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I just think it's one of those things that's easy. Again, it's like, it's hard to situ situate yourself in the evolution that's happening or revolution that's happening. But I think that's one of those, one of those key things. Um, and then I talked a little bit about form factors. I think, you know, the, the, the black slab of, ga of glass has served as well. And I think that will continue as a critical form factor, but but I think there's going to be a percentage of devices that will be foldable and novel and have different form factors. Um, and, and so I think that's the stable state. There's going to be more variety in the types of devices and more choice. And, and you know, Android really that is really about that. We, you know, we have this very vibrant set of device makers. So it, it really sort of plays to the strength of Android to enable these, these different kind of, kind of innovations. Um, so, so yeah, so I'm kind of, I, yeah, I'm, that's, I, a lot's cha still changing, and 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 I'm pretty excited about the future. Yeah, should be pretty interesting to see, and all those capabilities, and people may even I don't know one day make phone calls with their phones. Who knows? Could go anywhere. I, yeah, it's been a while since I made a phone call. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> I'll let you know when I do one. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.